we got a lot of good stuff to cover today. I hope that you got my um, email that we were going to push back problem 49 until Monday um, for obvious reasons. And then on Wednesday is when that pump-related assignment will be due. The majority of that content we've already covered. Uh, we'll get a little bit more about cavitation on Monday. And then the exam is going to be on Friday. Bring your equation packet that I previously handed out. Uh, it may include a problem where it would be useful for you to use Excel. And so if you prefer to use your own computer instead of the tablets, feel free and bring that. Uh, but what you won't be able to do is use a pre-existing spreadsheet. You can't use those uh, homework spreadsheets or the example spreadsheets. You'll have to start with a blank workbook to solve the problem. So uh, welcome to our imaginary and or invisible uh, high school freshmen or high school students who are supposed to be here today. I guess they didn't make it too bad for them. Because we're talking about water hammer and search tanks, which is good stuff. Any questions about these announcements before we get into it? All right. Well, let's watch some Water Hammer. And this isn't this isn't a music video, sadly. Uh, that was somehow related to the guy uh, turning off the water. Let's take a look at this other one. This is going to be on our recording. Huh? It gets worse. It's really, it's really bad over here. And the hot water heater. And the hot water heater. Right there. Huh? Oh, I see. You know it's doing it right now. Can you hear it? It's just making it. Well, it still would be in the way. So those people had a dishwasher that was uh, turning water on and off. And uh, so their automatic dishwasher has a valve that's opening and closing. And as it does that, they noticed that there was a strange noise coming from the water heater. So we're going to try and learn a little bit about the phenomenon that was on display in both of those uh, examples. It's water hammer that was the cause of the strange banging and clanging noise. So uh, let's say that there's a tank of water connected to a pipe, and at the end of the pipe is a valve. And uh, that valve is controlling the flow of water when it gets closed. And so just initially, water is moving freely. And so we've got a free surface of water at the top of the tank. Uh, water is moving at some velocity, v naught, And you'll notice that what we can do is measure the total energy in the water at any point by its elevation above the datum, z, the pressure head, and then there's a velocity head there related to the, uh, uh, to the, the speed that the water is traveling. Now h sub f represents the fact that the uh, pressure is decreasing due to pipe friction. So there's energy losses here. So water is moving freely, and we're going to consider what happens inside of a control volume. And uh, in that control volume, water is going to be flowing in, and water is going to be flowing out. And remember that when we did momentum problems in fluid mechanics, we found a force required to some sort of a change in velocity. And uh, the way we found the magnitude of that force was the mass flow rate, so the density times the volumetric flow rate, multiplied by the difference in velocity. Welcome. How are you guys? 
Have a seat. Let's get some uh, some notes here for you. We're talking about water hammer. You've missed a really great YouTube video, but the link's on here so you can watch it when you get home tonight. Gather all your friends together and show them the water hammer phenomenon that you learned about in college. So here's a picture of a reservoir, and water's flowing through a pipe, and uh, there's a valve at the end of the pipe, but right now the valve's open. Water's moving freely, and we're going to look at what happens. Water flows through this imaginary control volume, and it's just this imaginary box, and we're going to keep track of the water going into the box, water coming out of the box, and the box is surrounding a, sec a section of the pipe. So suddenly we close the valve. The valve is closed, and what happens is that the water that's close to the valve stops moving, but there is momentum there. There's water behind it that doesn't stop quite as instantaneously as the water that's right next to the valve. So the water that's further from the valve is still moving for just a split second as the water in front of it uh, has already stopped. It's sort of like traffic in a way, you know, when there's a red light. The cars that are right next to the red light stop, and then there's sort of this accordion effect as um, cars build up behind it. So because of the momentum force, the fact that the velocity in to the control volume stops suddenly, um, I'm sorry, the velocity out, the velocity out of the control volume, which is near the valve, suddenly stops, but there's still water coming into the control volume, so V in is positive for a bit longer than V out. That causes a, a force, and that force is applied against the surface of the valve. You know, the, if it's a gate valve, the gate comes down and interrupts the pipe, and so there is a, a wave of force that gets reflected backwards after it uh, bangs into the valve. It starts headed back the opposite direction. It's propagating backwards towards the reservoir. And what you can see now, as far as the energy grade line, uh, the energy grade line, since the water is not moving, there's no friction loss, whereas previously there was friction loss. So um, there's no friction loss, and in fact, you'll notice that there is an increase in energy. There is an increase in energy for a certain amount of the water. And um, these little dashed lines here on either side of the pipe indicate that the pipe is actually starting to expand because there's such a huge increase in pressure, the pipe will flex a little bit, and um, it's sort of like a hose. I'm sure you've used a garden hose before, and when you turn it on, you'll notice that the garden hose swells a little bit. Well, it's made out of rubber. You'd expect it to swell, but even a metal pipe like this will swell a little bit because of the pressure wave that's moving through it. And the speed of that wave moving backwards through the water is called uh, celerity. It's the, the speed of celerity uh, is the, the velocity of a pressure wave as it moves through water. So what causes all of this is the fact that water is just a little bit compressible. Remember in fluid mechanics we said initially that water was an incompressible fluid, but then a little bit later on when our uh, sophistication got to the point where we could acknowledge that really water is very slightly compressible, um, what happens from that is because it's compressible, that's what allows the water to pile up a little bit at the valve as it closes very quickly. And so since it's compressible, and since the pipe is a little bit elastic, that's what causes the pipe wall to expand as the water compresses. So, so far what we've done is we had the water moving, close the valve suddenly, and that suddenly part is important. We'll talk about the specifics of how sudden is sudden. Uh, but it's closed quickly, and there comes a certain point where the pressure wave makes it all the way to the reservoir. And all of this is happening really, really quickly. Celerity, the, the velocity of that pressure wave is very high. And so very quickly, um, all of the wave has made it back into the tank, and the pipe expanded. And what's interesting is that because the pipe expanded, there's more water in the pipe than there was before. Because remember, it swells up a little bit, and so more water comes from the reservoir into the pipe. And so this delta H, what it's representing is where the water level used to be. And so in this image, you notice that there's a pretty deep depth of water in that uh, reservoir. 
but because the pipe swells, more of the water goes into the pipe from the reservoir, and so now there's less water in the reservoir, and the pipe is swelled up, and uh, so there's more energy in the pipe than there really ought to be, because it's just temporarily expanded, and then it's going to contract again and send more water back into the reservoir. And so it's sort of like a yo-yo effect. It's going back and forth between this pressure wave banging up against the valve, uh, causing the pipe to expand, water flooding into the pipe because the pipe's bigger than it used to be, and then, then there's too much energy in the pipe, and so the water flows back into the reservoir. And that's what's happening now. You can see that the velocity of the water is now in the reverse direction as the pipe that has swollen up because of a high pressure inside of the, uh, in the pipe due to the wave. The water is now flowing back into the reservoir, and it returns back towards the valve at the speed of celerity. And so in those videos we listened to, you heard like a banging over and over and over. It's a very repetitive process going back and forth very quickly between the valve and wherever the pressure increase can be relieved. In this case, it's a surge tank. Uh, in the case of that water heater, they didn't really have anywhere that the pressure wave could be relieved. That water tank was full, and so the wave can be reflected back and forth uh, for a pretty long time which is why they sometimes will put in special uh, relief valves or it's almost like a shock, absor a shock absorber uh, near water heaters to try and uh, mitigate the effects of water hammer. So it's a really interesting process and, uh, and it all depends on wave reflection. Uh, water compressibility is what's a big part of the reason why this happens. And Compressibility is the change of volume of some amount of water in response to a, a pressure that's applied. And so if we had a, uh, an element of water, and if it's one cubic meter of water, then um, we applied some pressure to it, its volume may change fractionally. And for water, it varies a little bit depending on the temperature of the water, but this Compressibility ratio is how much of the volume changes in response to how much pressure. And um, it takes a really, really high amount of pressure. You'll see here that the units here are inverse gigapascals. And so the interpretation of that is that uh, to get water to compress, um, even just 1% will require uh, about a gigapascal of pressure. Uh, and what happens when water becomes pressurized is that there are these different alignments of uh, water molecules as they associate with one another, and that's how extra space is found. It, it, the water that's normally uh, very random can have these different packing arrangements that allows it to uh, find just a tiny bit more space to fit more water into the same volume. We won't actually be solving problems in terms of compressibility. It's the inverse of compressibility that we're more interested in. And it's actually called the bulk modulus of elasticity. And bulk modulus is a ratio. Instead of volume divided by pressure, this is pressure divided by volume. And so specific volume is how much volume is occupied by a unit of mass. And so one kilogram of water is requiring one liter of volume. And so the change of volume with respect to some incremental increase in pressure um, relative to the specific volume of the liquid is the bulk modulus of elasticity. And so here's a table of, it's a fluid property, at different pressures and different temperatures, the bulk modulus of elasticity for water. So these are the values that we're going to have to substitute into calculations in order to find out, um, for example, how compressible the water is due to a certain, uh, a certain pressure wave that's building up. And then we're also going to have to consider the material of the pipe, because remember, the pipe is expanding at the same time that the water is compressing. So celerity is the speed that water is uh, having this pressure wave travel through it. And theoretically, you can calculate celerity by the bulk modulus of the fluid and the density of the fluid. And 
the theoretical celerity wave depends on just water out in the open, like in the ocean. This theoretical wave is when it's unconfined by any sort of a vessel or a pipe. And we use the theoretical velocity or the theoretical celerity in order to find the actual velocity of the pressure wave through an enclosed pipe. So we have to do a bit of a correction. You notice that the theoretical celerity only depends on the fluid property, bulk modulus of elasticity and density. But then when we want to find out how quickly is that pressure wave moving through water inside of a pipe, we have to consider the uh, diameter of the pipe, the pipe's thickness, and the, uh, the bulk modulus, which is a, a water property, and then a pipe property, the uh, bulk modulus of elasticity for the pipe. And so we're comparing the thickness of the pipe and the pipe properties. And here's a table of uh, essentially how much a pipe is going to respond to an increase in pressure. It's the, the bulk modulus of elasticity means the same thing for a solid as it does for a liquid. It's just uh, how compressible it is, or the inverse of compressibility. But when we, uh, when we put all these known information, like the, the thickness of the pipe, the bulk modulus of the pipe and the water, uh, into this equation, then we can find how quickly the, uh, the wave moves. So why do you think that's important? When we go back to this diagram of a valve at the end of a long pipe, why do you think it matters how quickly the wave is moving through the pipe? You've got a shock wave, and the shock wave starts at a valve, and then it travels through the pipe, and then it gets into the reservoir. And we've been talking about a valve being closed quickly. And so any thoughts on where this is headed, like why we care uh, how quickly a pressure wave makes it from the valve into the reservoir? It has to do with the reservoir being able to like, contain the pressure that makes it back. Yeah. Related to that, definitely. Um, it turns out that if it, if the water can make a round trip, if the pressure wave can make a round trip um, before the valve is closed, then the shock wave is uh, a lot less troublesome than if the valve is closed before the wave makes it back. So we have to consider a round trip. Okay, so there's water flowing through the pipe. Okay, we've got our reservoir, and here's my valve. Okay, so water's moving through here, and I start to close the pipe. If the shock wave goes from the valve to the reservoir and back, and it's completely closed, then that's a huge shock wave. But if it starts to close, and that initial shock wave goes to the reservoir and back, and then there's still a partial opening, then that relieves a lot of the pressure. And so in this, uh, in this initial description, when I say a valve is suddenly closed, what I'm talking about is it's closed faster than the water can make the round trip from the reservoir and back. And so like in the case of that washing machine video that we were watching, um, is the distance that the, the shock wave has to travel is just from the dishwasher to the water heater. And so it's a very close distance, and it's going to be um, it's going to be kind of a little bit difficult to close the valve fast enough that you're closing the valve all the way before the shock wave can get back. But in a city water supply, since they're such a long distance, they have to be a lot more careful about closing valves quickly because the uh, the nearest reservoir may be very far away where that shock wave can be relieved. So here's how we can calculate the travel time of the, of the pressure wave, is just by knowing the length of the pipe that it has to travel, and then the uh, celerity, the, the speed of the wave through the pipe. The speed, of course, will be in meters per second. The length will be in meters. And that gives us the travel time in uh, seconds. And now the maximum pressure that could occur is related to the velocity of the water, the celerity of the pressure wave, and the density of the fluid. And the worst case scenario is that 
Like I said before, if the valve is closed faster than the travel time, that's when the maximum pressure will occur. That you have this maximum maximum surge. And if you're allowing, if you're closing it slow enough that the wave can make the round trip before the valve is closed, then you'll still have a pressure increase, but it won't be this maximum increase. All right, so let's put this into practice. And what I'd like us to do is I'd like uh, each one of our high school uh, guests to match up with a, a student, because I don't think you guys brought calculators today, right? All right. These guys all have calculators in spades. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So why don't you come up uh, and sit here? Some of you have game tags on. Um, Cameron, you go back there and look at them. You can come up and what's that? Your tour guide? You don't want to run in there? Damien, you come up with here. What's your name? Paige. So you sit right back right here. You sit back and work with Alan. Okay, so we've got an example here where water is flowing through this reservoir. The pipe is 200, I'm sorry, 2,000 feet long. We are knowing the diameter of the pipe, the thickness of it, and we've got the bolt modulus of elasticity both for the pipe and for the water. Now, unfortunately, we're working in traditional units, and that always complicates things. Remember, if we're working in PSI, we have to multiply by 144 to get it into pounds per square foot. Uh, the diameter here, Instead of using inches, we need to convert that into feet and so on. But the process that we're going to go through is just, it's in the stages that I've laid out the equations. First, find the theoretical celerity, which is the velocity of the pressure wave. Then find the actual celerity, how quickly the, uh, the pressure wave is moving through this particular pipe. And then we're going to take a look at the, uh, the travel time and the maximum pressure. All right. So if you're working with one of our high school guests, help them uh, do the calculations too. Show them, show them how it works in fluid mechanics and hydraulics. So I mean, pretty much like a Okay. Well, let's talk about this example. Uh, we start off by finding basically the velocity of the water and use the continuity equation for that. We know that the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area will give us the velocity, taking care to change from inches into feet so that the units are consistent. And it's really easy to make the mistake of uh, leaving it in inches if you don't write the units as you are, uh, you know, don't include the units along in the calculations. It's easier to make that mistake. Um, we find the velocity of the water, I'm sorry, the velocity of the pressure wave, the theoretical celerity, uh, 4874 feet per second. And so um, that's almost a mile a second, the, the speed of that wave. And I don't know if that's related to like the, uh, the speed that tsunamis go. You know, I think that actually this might be a different thing than, than the, the speed that a tsunami crosses the ocean. But, um, when we consider the effect of the pipe constraining the movement of the pressure wave, the pipe slows it down a little bit because the pipe is flexing and I suppose that reduces some of its movement a little bit. Um, so we find 4397 feet per second is what the pressure wave is moving through the pipe. And then the maximum velocity, I'm sorry, the maximum pressure increase potentially it could increase by uh, 58,000 pounds per square foot. And if you convert that into uh, SI units, that's 2,800 kPa. Now, a normal range of pressure values in a municipal water network like we have here would be between 240 and 850 kPa. And so 850 would maybe be the maximum that you'd expect in a water network. And so this is saying that the pressure wave can get up to 2,800, and that's enough to uh, rupture pipes, potentially, if there's a corroded spot in a pipe where there's been rust or... Uh, accidental damage or um, fittings can explode, you know, the uh, bolts can pop off of the fittings and 
uh, ordinarily what will fail most often is people's water heater. Right? You know, people will have leaks in the water heater when uh, a surge comes through. So um, what we need to do is double the length because remember it's a round trip. And if the valve is closed in less than 0.91 seconds, then we're going to see uh, that maximum pressure. But if it's longer than this time pressure, then I'm sorry, longer than this time, then the uh, the pressure increase won't be that maximum. You know, there still is going to be some sort of a pressure increase, but because there's still an opening for the water to come through, remember what this is all based on is the uh, momentum equation. What's causing the what's causing the increase in pressure is the fact that in a control volume. You've got water going out at a different speed than it's coming in. And so the worst case scenario is that water stops completely and that you've got this velocity still coming in. But uh, if you're closing the valve more slowly, then the difference between out and in won't be as extreme, and then you won't have a, uh, a pressure surge that's quite as bad. Any questions about this concept so far? I would feel so good if I got a question from one of our visitors. It would make me feel like you're interested and that you're considering Marshall and that you know, like you came out here on a snowy day and it was worth it, you know? So if you guys can muster up a question, I'd be glowing on the inside. It doesn't have to be now, and no pressure, of course. No pressure at all. But if you don't ask a question, I'll probably cry myself to to sleep, is what I'm saying, really. <laughs> Yeah, I'll probably quit teaching. So one of the ways that you can relieve a, uh, uh, a reflective um, surge is to put in some sort of a, a relief tank. And what a surge tank would allow you to do like this is uh, the water level will rise and drop in response to either the pipe flexing or an increase in pressure. If a surge tank isn't there, and there's nowhere for the uh, for the um, the water hammer to be relieved, then it can be a lot more damaging because it'll just reflect back and forth, back and forth, like you were hearing in those videos. And so the surge tank is one means of overcoming it. And just to uh, compare what we've done so far now into designing the required size of a surge tank, um, you have to have an idea of what the the depth is going to be what depth of a surge tank is required. And of course, that's going to depend on the cross-sectional area of the surge tank. If you've got a big diameter surge tank, then it's not going to have to be as tall uh, when that volume of water fills in there. And the surge tank is filling when the water starts to rush out of the pipe and back towards the, in the direction of the surge tank. Because the pressure increase at the valve, remember, causes the pipe to swell. And as the pipe swells, more water goes into it than really ought to be there. And then as the water stops moving, then the pipe will begin to contract again and pushing the water back towards uh, its original origin. And the surge tank can relieve that and sort of calm down the water hammer and allow it to dissipate. So here we've got the same example. We have this 2,000-foot-long uh, pi 2000 pipe that has an initial velocity equal to what we had in our earlier example. Um, what if we want the, uh, the diameter of the, we want to find the diameter of the tank so that the maximum surge depth, S, is going to be one foot. So I'd like you to continue this example and solve for the area of the tank and then use that to find the uh, tank diameter. So A sub T is the unknown in that equation, and then use that, and area is pi B squared divided by 4, and so that then the diameter is 4 times the area divided by pi to the 1 half power. So really, this is what we're trying to find. What diameter should that tank be? All right, so what I did was rearrange the equation. Instead of having it solve for S max, we, 
we said we only want the surge depth to be a foot, so what sort of tank area is required to ensure that it only gets to a, a foot in depth during the surge? So uh, what we're looking at with the area, the pipe area, and the length is basically the volume of water that's in the pipe. And then what this term on the bottom ends up being is uh, related to how much of the volume of the water that's in the pipe will actually get into the surge tank, the ratio of the S max to the velocity of the water and, and so forth. And so ultimately we find the required diameter of the pipe 18 feet and then um, that tells us uh, what sort of surge tank would relieve the um, would relieve the water hammer and make sure that it doesn't keep indefinitely reflecting back and forth between the valve and the origin of the water. So water hammer is really interesting, good stuff. If we just look back at the uh, announcements, remember that you've got this last problem, uh, 849 due on Monday, and then on Wednesday, the problems from Chapter 9 are due. And I would recommend that you get started on those pump problems from Chapter 9 over the weekend so that you don't have to do it all between Monday and Wednesday. Not that they're that challenging, but just a suggestion there. Well, I'll take any questions if there are any. If there are any questions before we, before we go, I think we've got a minute for some questions. Well, I'm glad that you came to join us today. I hope that you consider Marshall. I hope that you consider engineering. You know, engineering is a hard major, but it's definitely worth it. It's a big investment of effort, but you'll be glad you did when you graduate and have job opportunities and an interesting challenge every day. So we hope that you join us, and maybe I'll see you in the fall, and, and I'll definitely see the rest of you on Monday. So have a good weekend.